future of finance is decentralized. Chainlink's role in building a trustless and tokenized ecosystem. Please welcome Sergei Nazarov, co-founder of Chainlink, and our moderator, King Leung, Global Head of Financial Services, FinTech and Sustainability, Invest Hong Kong, the government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Wow, time flies. You know, actually, it was uh, just it's about the same time last year that I had the great privilege to moderate the fireside chats remotely uh, with Sergey. So now the real Sergey is here. I'm just super excited. In fact, I think before we start, I just want to didn't get a chance to, to tell you just now, Sergey, was that uh, last year after our session, so I went down to the audience and talked to some of the particularly the uh, the crypto native the digital asset crowd. And our session was the best in the, in the eyes for two reasons. And uh, the comment was, uh, Sergey is a straight talker. You just speak your mind. So basically, all the things that you believe in, you just show them. And this is something that uh, the audience truly appreciate. And secondly, is that uh, you are truly a visionary. That the things that you've been looking at like, years ago, now, now gradually playing out. So being able to sort of listen to you again, to help us understand how this market is going to evolve going forward. It's also a treat to our audience. Great, great to be here, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, now, so I guess uh, to start with, just to warm up, I understand that uh, Sergey, you've been traveling quite a lot to Asia, to a number of the major hubs. Yeah. So can you help us to understand better about uh, how your current view is about the Hong Kong market? I, I think, the size of the Hong Kong market and the volume that the Hong Kong market commands is, is the biggest in Asia. And I think that the digital asset uh, trend is reformatting volume into the blockchain format, right? So just logically, if you do a basic calculation and ask yourself, if I take a market and I believe that 10 or 20% of the assets or the volume of, or the transactions will be in a blockchain format, what's the most attractive market for me in Asia? Just by the very basic arithmetic, Hong Kong is the most attractive market, just because the numbers are there, basically. The other thing that's attractive about Hong Kong is the regulatory regime, how open-minded and forward-looking the regulatory kind of um, agencies are and, and their representatives, and how much guidance has been released by them in favor of stable coins, in favor of various uh, kind of innovations in the digital asset space. Mm -hmm. So now you have two very, very strong factors of big market, very open, forward-looking, progressive regulatory regime. That's two very powerful, powerful pros. Um, and then the, you have a third big factor that I think about a lot, which is all the money in China that has historically found its way into the Hong Kong market under a set of controls and under a set of limitations, but it's still an immense amount of money, and I think the current system sees Hong Kong as the natural place for that money to flow. So you're not even talking about the money that is in the, in the system now, you're talking about you know, possibly more money from, from mainland China flowing into the Hong Kong financial sector. So all, all three of these things are like very powerful uh, inescapable forces in favor of, of Hong Kong's position as a digital asset hub. And from the conversations I've had with people in Hong Kong, the concept of being a hub is, is important. And so I think this uh, direction towards a hub is something Hong Kong is going to pursue and uh, be successful at. Well, th 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 thank you for the, uh, the observations. And that also make uh, us uh, all very excited. Now, I guess the other question I'd like to, uh, to hear your views is that obviously the Chainlink is known for the, your Oracle service in which uh, you see a lot of data, you work with a lot of uh, stakeholders around the world, you truly have that global view. Now, and also you are now, this year, to my understanding from, from you and your colleagues, you have a very strong focus to try to connect the TrackFi world with the web free world. Mm. Now, so, with blockchain being that sort of conduit. So how do you see that 
the Asian and global markets are being connected. So, so what, what's the observation? So one, one of the big advantages of, of blockchains, especially in the public chain world, is that they're inherently global. So one of the reasons that DeFi, various tokens, cryptocurrencies, tokenized financial products have grown so quickly is because when you launch a financial product in the traditional world, you have to launch it in that specific market only to those people in that market only. So your market size is constrained. When you launch a financial product or a cryptocurrency or a token onto at least the public chain, you have a global market. Now the thing that's been missing from, from that global market is the value that is stuck in institutions, sometimes in you know, very traditional formats. The challenge then is how do you take the global nature of blockchain technology and how do you extend it to be accessible to traditional financial institutions and their users? So how does a traditional financial institutional user in Dubai purchase a token generated in Hong Kong under your framework? And how do they do that from a regulated institution? And then how does a institutional user in Hong Kong purchase some token in some other jurisdiction and then bring it back into their wallet or into their institution in Hong Kong, right? That is where the crypto industry goes from being about two and a half to three trillion to tens of trillions in value, is when all of that institutional capital that's locked in existing systems is able to enter and interact with blockchains. What, what we fundamentally do is we unlock all of that capital to move in and out and between blockchains by creating connectivity between the blockchains and between the, the institutional systems and blockchains, right? So the first problem you're gonna have is how do I get my institution's system to make an account on a chain, to generate a transaction, to move value from a user account into a blockchain account? And then the second problem will be how do I interact with multiple chains? Then you'll have a lot of other problems along the way like identity problems, market data problems, all kinds of data and identity and connectivity problems, all of which we solve also. So the, the real challenge for us is not just continuing to power the majority of DeFi. We already power the majority of uh, the DeFi trend and Chainlink has grown the DeFi trend from sub 100 million to over 200 billion throughout that time and up until now, from the beginning until now, powering the majority of DeFi and continue to power the majority of DeFi. But even if DeFi is a 100 billion or a 200 billion or a 300 billion or a 500 billion dollar market, in, in the wider scheme of the financial industry, that's really not big enough. Mm -hmm. And so the only way that DeFi and public chains and real world assets and all of these innovations that we're so excited about go to the next level is by users you know, of HSBC, users of Hang Seng Bank, users of large institutions being able to put their value into those financial products securely and efficiently, that's kind of the next stage of our industry for it to really grow. So, so that's kind of the project we've undertaken. Well, I think for those of you who may not know about uh, Chainlink enough, I have to say that uh, this is a, a company with a leader that I had the privilege to uh, watch up close and personal in Barcelona, the SmartCon, over a year ago. And I'm not, I'm not joking, but those of you who attended, you, you can also validate this. So when uh, Sergey was sharing his, his views about uh, how he would like to break uh, solve some really hard problems, and then when you announced the, the plans, I still remember I was, I was in the audience. There, there were several standing ovations from the builders who've been uh, following Chainlink for some time. Now, I'm not sure about you. Uh, I've been to a lot of events. I would rarely see people give standing ovation to, in a speech. Okay, so this is really speaking volumes about the things that uh, uh, Sergey and his team try to solve. Now, uh, of course, I think some time ago, I, I, I lost track of time. But then I remember when I first heard of Chainlink trying to marry or cross over Web3 with ThreadFi, people were like, what? 
that's a really tough thing to, to crack. The next thing we know, I, saw, I think we saw, we saw that uh, you guys are collaborating with Swift. People are like, wow, that's amazing. So, so can you help uh, update our audience about how that collaboration is happening, who are the other Traffi people coming in, and so can you give us a quick update? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Just really quick, seamless plug and advertisement. SmartCon that you attended last year is actually this year in Hong Kong, and it's actually this week, and it's happening Wednesday and Thursday of this week at the Kerry Hotel in the financial you know, center of Hong Kong. So if you're interested in these topics, you're welcome to join us there. That's this week on Wednesday and Thursday, if you want to see more of, of what I'm discussing here. Um, yeah, the work with Swift has been in, in the works for over seven years. We did uh, two public pilots. The, the second public pilot was released last year. This, uh, this year, last week at Cybos, which is Swift's big conference, which was in Beijing this year, um, we kind of showed a working demonstration of how this would work in a production setting. So how would the actual Swift network interact with actual blockchains and use Swift messages that are the most widely accepted financial standard across all banks and financial institutions with over 11,000 banks and financial institutions on that standard. How does that messaging standard you interact with blockchains? And this is a very good example of a practical implementation of what we just spoke about a minute ago, where if you're in an institution and you've been using Swift messages to sign transactions about payments, about assets, about all kinds of events for the last 30, 40, 50 years, which is how long that's been happening, then it's a lot easier for you to just continue using those Swift messages if you could ever get them to be used on a blockchain. So the logical next step there is, how do we get existing standards like Swift to be used for interactions with a blockchain? And that's the body of work that we demonstrated in its, in its pre-production form where we showed how it's actually going to work in production and how it would eventually be used in live trials and how it would be utilized by these big banks and institutions. So that was a really big kind of event and a, and a big milestone for us because the next step beyond that will be you know, live trials and usage and real, real adoption of, of that service. That's what we're hoping for and pushing for at this point. Um, but it's, it's a very big milestone and I think if you can actually get even a small percentage of those 11,000 banks and institutions to start interacting with blockchains in an efficient, secure way, the market size of, of the blockchain industry, whether it's a public chain or a private chain, whether it's an RWA or a tokenized fund or a stablecoin, the market size kind of really explodes from there, right? So it just kind of goes from a few trillion to tens of trillions, and it's really the path to hundreds of trillions. So I, I think that that's really good work that we did, and it's made a lot of progress in a very short amount of time, because if you look at what we put out for the pilot last year versus the demonstration we did at Cybos this year, it's a huge um, improvement in getting to production and getting to something that can actually work with real systems. And it's, it's a huge kind of leap forward. So it was, was very positive, and I'm very hopeful um, about the direction this is going in right now. Well, I'm uh, conscious of time, but I have so many things I want to ask you, Sergey. So perhaps I would just uh, have another uh, question to just kind of wrap up our fireside chat today. And that is, from your perspective, what kind of asset classes, or maybe asset in particular, that you see would benefit the most from tokenization? I think one of the most positive things I've seen in a while in our industry is that the asset managers are now pushing the adoption of digital assets. In the capital markets, in the banking industry, the whole point of the system is really to service asset owners, which are like sovereign wealth funds and the end owners, and asset managers, which, is our, which are kind of an intermediary between the asset owners and the financial system. So historically, when asset management firms begin to push a technology or a trend, that trend starts to get adoption from everybody else down in the value chain. The banks, the financial market infrastructures, everybody. And that's what we see with the tokenization of funds. So BlackRock's Biddle, Fidelity's funds, some of which Chainlink powers live on production. These kind of um, 
levels of adoption by asset managers, I think have started a, a next stage in the adoption of digital assets and blockchain technology by, uh, by the whole industry. So I think tokenized funds are going to continue to grow. I think real world assets, so the tokenization of real estate, carbon credits, those things. And I think uh, stable coins. Stable coins, eventually every bank will end up making a stable coin and it'll be used as a common form of payment backed by central bank digital currency or by private reserves. So I think those are the three categories that I'm, that I'm really seeing. That's great. Now, I, I think that this is uh, something that hopefully can be uh, very helpful and insightful to you. Because in, in many ways, when I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, Sergey, they've been sort of playing around with different assets to tokenize them as a POC. But sometimes I, I was like, well, are they really betting on the, on the right direction? So I think what we just uh, shared is something that hopefully we got some uh, entrepreneurs in the audience that can help you, uh, with the, the comment from so it can help you narrow down the focus. Now, I guess just as a uh, final comment, because I see that our uh, time is up, it's uh, also a shout out to all of you. Uh, if you have already signed up to SmartCon, uh, great, I'll see you there. I'll be there uh, Wednesday and Thursday too. Now, but if you haven't, then uh, definitely look me up on the LinkedIn. You can easily find me on LinkedIn, ping me, and I'll try to sort out tickets uh, for some of you because we are very close partner uh, with uh, uh, our SmartCon Chainlink. So that's why the, we are definitely full supportive. So ping me. And if not, the last channel is, in case I'm not responding to your request fast enough, fintech at investhk.gov.hk. Fintech at investhk.gov.hk is the email. Just the email and we'll get sorted out. Now, the reason why this is so important is because as I was discussing with uh, Sergey's team, like Todd and the other, other folks, in planning out to have SmartCon in Hong Kong, it's because while the, we are very proud about uh, the Hong Kong Fintech Week being that gathering place for everybody to learn all these new trends, but we feel that we don't have enough depth on the technology side the technical side, that we can cater to the builders, the engineers, the, the build developers community. So that's why while the FinTech Week is more broad, more, more commercial centric, then the, the SmartCon is a combination, both commercial and also very deep, deep tech conversation. So you want to learn more about it, or if you're builders yourself, this is definitely an awesome event to go there and meet with some like-minded people. And with that, this is really our great privilege to have uh, Sergey with us in person this time and also have SmartCon in Hong Kong. This is really a blessing for our broader community in Hong Kong. So I just want to thank you. So again, can we have a big round of applause to Sergey? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey and King.